The first thing I'd like to bring to your attention is our Innovation Lunch and Learn series. This is something we hold every second month. We bring in two speakers. We uh, bring in topics that are mining related or something that could be related to mining. We're not trying to sell any uh, specific uh, application. We're just trying to generate ideas and discussion. We videotape all these sessions and then we put them on our website, we put them in YouTube, and we put them on the CIM website. And there's great appetite for this type of presentations. We get thousands of hits for each one of these. I'm just showing you four here, but there's, there's uh, two dozen of them on, on the website. They go from safety to uh, new products to different uh, exploration techniques. So we're cut, cutting the whole uh, gamut from environmental. Here's one from uh, genomics from the University of Toronto. Quite exciting uh, uh, topics, and, I, and I, I welcome you to, to take a look at some of these at, at your leisure. In fact, uh, I'm going to highlight four uh, technologies that we're looking at, and uh, three of these are, uh, have been speakers at, uh, at our uh, Lunch and Learns. And I have invited a few people who we deal business with, and they're going to be in the back during the presentation for you to ask uh, questions. The second thing I'd like to talk about is a hackathon that we held two weekends ago. If you're not familiar with the term, this is something that came out of the gaming community, came out of programming. And what they would do is they take 50 to 100 people, programmers, gamers, and they would lock them in a room, give them a problem, and then after a couple of days, they would just keep feeding them pizzas and Red Bull and then see what they came out with. And we did the same thing in mining. We had two sponsors, uh, ourselves and two other sponsors, one being Agnico Eagle and the other one being Hatch. And we posed a question. We posed two questions, and the group had to pick one of those. One was different ways to transport material. So not trucks, whatever else they could think of. And the other one is better ways to handle, handle tailings. And believe me, these people do not look at the world at the same way we do. These are 19-year-olds, 25-year-olds in that group there. And who knows in 30 years if the tailings pond will look like the one Don showed or something else that they generated over the weekend. But there was a lot of excitement in the room. We had people from a couple of people in mining and geology, but most of them were outside the field people with business backgrounds, people from medicine, people from, from programming, whatever, and they didn't know much about the topic, so we had mentors come in, sit with them, and then over a couple of days, uh, we, we talked to them, and then they had seven minutes to, to give their, their spiel, and we had Michael Weckerly, one of the dragons on Dragon's Den, there to, to help them out on how to make a good presentation, and then it's amazing, from a Friday to Sunday, the number of ideas and the types of ideas generated. So we have all their presentations. We have a little video of this. And if you want to know more about it, just come see me after this presentation. So I'm going to go through four different technologies that we're looking. One of them is called AdRock. These are one of our speakers, but AdRock's not here. And this is what I call virtual drilling. So what they do is they go in, but you don't need permits. It's a small little case. You don't need a lot of equipment. You don't need reagents. You don't need chemicals. So it's a vertical. Uh, you could see the uh, vertical line over there. So it goes about two kilometers below the surface. And depending on what's below there, water, oil, hidden treasure, mineralization, whatever you're looking for, each of those has a little different fingerprint. So we teach it what to look for by showing it core. And then it comes back with its prediction. And uh, it's going to be hard to see it. I can, I can explain it later. But if you look at the left, that's what our geologists came up with. And then look at the right, that's what ADRA came up with. And they matched every single mineralization that our geologists came up with, except they found one extra one, and they were able to predict the floor, which our drilling uh, wasn't able to reach. So it's quite an exciting uh, uh, innovation that we think will carry great weight going forward. A lot quicker. You don't have to send out assays. You don't have to wait weeks and months to get back your assays. It's virtual drilling. The second one, I see we have two professors from University of Toronto, and they can talk about the technology later, is we have a drone project with them. It's a combined project with the Lausanne Institute of Mining, as well as the um, uh, U of T Institute of, uh, of Aerospace. And what they have is a drone, which we're all familiar with, but now it's taking it one step further. So instead of just volume calculations and instead of just looking at structures, you could actually add hyperspectral to the drone and see what the mineralization is of the, of the uh, ore or the rock. You could also look at uh, post-blast fragmentation, instantaneously see how efficient the blast was. You don't have to crush it. You don't have to... Uh, screen it, you're automatically able to see how good the blast was and where the material ended up with. 
And then the other one, you could use it for inspections to see shifts within the mine, see excavation and so forth. So it's, it's quite an exciting project and I think you'll hear a lot about it going forward. The third one I'd like to talk about is ore sorting, another one of our uh, lunch and learns. You could just download it at your, at your leisure. And the whole idea is here is people think of uh, ore sorting as optical ore sorting, separating black rock from white rock if you want to make baby powder. For some reason, people don't like black talc, uh, talc so they, they, they only keep the white material. But it goes way beyond that. You can sort it on dual energy spectrums like you have at the uh, airport. You can sort it with near infrared. You can sort it with lasers. lasers. So whatever the application is, instead of treating 100% of your rock, why not treat 20% of your, of your mass and get rid of 80% of, of it up front? In fact, when we did this test in Mexico, we found that about 25% of the mass carried over 95% of the gold. So in general terms, most mines are treating all of that and most of the rocks contain zero or subgrade material. So why not sort it up front and not have to have all the processing costs associated with it? So this is something you'll hear in the future. Ten years ago this was known, but the, the, the electronics weren't able to keep up with it. Now they have machines that started at 30 tons per hour. I've seen ones at 33,000 tons per hour, and now they're developing one at 120,000 uh, tons per hour ore sorting that decides which rock it wants, which rock it doesn't want, or you can sort it by shovel by shovel. The fourth one I'm going to talk about is a, a sensor from Scanometrics, and Steve Slepsky's in the back there. He'll be available to answer questions as well. So we have two applications from Steve. One is we put uh, sensors on our crusher to see for vibration, to see how the crusher is working. And they're able to tell if it's moist material going through the crusher, if it's uh, running well, if it's leaning to the right, if it's leaning to the left. But the one I showed here is a moisture sensor. So we've embedded moisture and compaction sensors inside our leach pad. Based on test work, we know there's an optimum range for the leach pad uh, uh, irrigation. If it's too low, the gold recovery is, is slowed down. If it's too high, again, the gold recovery is too low. There is an actual optimum range, and the operators are able to look at it on a daily basis. I can look at it on my, on my iPhone, and you can see when it's red, it's too dry. When it's green or blue, it's in which range. So the operators can adjust to see where they want to irrigate. In fact, in the future, you'd want this automatically control, uh, controlled by valves, and based on the color, where to add the right amount of irrigation to the leach pad. So before I hand it back to Rob, I just want to conclude with a couple of points. First of all, innovation and R&D are not the same thing. People use these two interchangeably. If I take money and I go to U of T and I turn money into some knowledge, that's R&D. When I take that knowledge and turn it into money, that's innovation. We're not here to tinker. We're here to improve our assets. You've heard a lot about uh, copper and, and uh, copper sulfides, you heard about, about them in uh, Argentina, you heard about them in Mexico. These are things that are going to take a lot of new ideas, uh, it's, it's going beyond the gold sphere. So we're getting into different uh, metallurgies and a lot of these techniques that we're going to be working with, we're going to get us over the hump at the, first of all, more reliable operations. For example, adding a sensor to a crusher gives you a more reliable operation. More ounces, getting the ounces out of the copper zone getting uh, Los Azulis to market quicker, lower costs, of course, environmental considerations to clean up ponds, to, to uh, have uh, more water recycled back to the, the process. And of course, we want to be considered a partner of choice. We're, we, we believe we are that now, and we want to be that uh, in the future. Ten years ago, they said power was knowledge. Now they say partners is knowledge. And that's, that's where we'd like to position ourselves. Thank you.